head. All right, cool. Uh, so here we go. So we're going to talk about part two in our uh, STEMI. Yeah. Yeah, however. Yeah, okay, so. So we talked about some of the things that we look at, right? We talked about uh, ST segment elevation, depression, Q waves or pathological Q waves. And so what I want to do now is I just want to quickly review. Hey, look at that. New discussion. That must be Ken. It, it made it to Canvas there. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about this here. Uh, let me just choose a slightly different color. All right. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the progression of findings. Like what happens when we have a STEMI. So the first thing that happens, on the ECG at least, is we develop what are known as hyperacute T waves right up here. And these hyperacute T waves tend to develop within minutes. And then they tend to, they, they tend to change very quickly, however. So this is a finding that is, is often not seen. We often don't see this because we often are not taking care of our patient within the first few minutes of their, their STEMI, uh, of, the, of the occlusion or the precipitating event, the event that precipitates the, the STEMI or whatever um, they go on to develop. Um, so to find these hyperacute T waves here, and it really looks like an enlarged, a tall T wave. The T wave gets very tall. And we haven't talked about this yet, but there is another condition that impacts the T waves. Hyperkalemia is classically known to impact the T waves and make them very tall as well. Um, so this can look like hyperkalemia, but we often just don't see this when we run a 12 lead because we're already we've already developed or the, the, the STEMI has already progressed by the time we get to our patient. So this is not a particularly common finding for that reason, these hyperacute T waves. Um, but when you see them and you, you have somebody who has these new onset signs and symptoms that suggest STEMI, okay, keep that in the back of your mind that this could very well develop on, into a STEMI, hence the reason why when you have somebody where you suspect an acute coronary syndrome, you should be doing serial 12 leads on that, that person every five to 10 minutes, right? Because this very well, you could very well see this and it very well could progress into a STEMI and so on and so forth. Um, so you wanna be running or rerunning or doing those serial 12 leads to pick up on any patterns or any um, changes that are developing over time. Okay. And then within minutes to hours, we have our classic signs, of course, which we talked, talked about already, but the ST segment elevation. Occasionally, this can be preceded by ST segment depression. That is to say that you will have a T wave inversion, ST segment depression indicating ischemia, and then as you start having injury, then your ST segments will become elevated. Okay, so you very well may see um, hyperacute T wave, ST depression, and then ST elevation. Again, that's why it's so important for us if we run a 12 lead and you see depression, let's say you see ST segment depression in 2-3 AVF, you would initially go, well, maybe this is a, an instemi um, or unstable angina. Right? And then if you stop there and you don't do any follow-up 12 leads, you may miss the fact that the patient is now developed or transitioned into ST elevation um, during your transport. Right? And so you'll call the hospital and you'll say, hey, I've got ST depression and 2-3 AVF, looks like an NSTEMI. And at some hospitals, their protocols... Do their protocols necessarily dictate that they activate the cath lab for an NSTEMI? No. Right? If we have ST depression, we don't know if that's an NSTEMI or we don't know if that is unstable angina. What do we have to do? We have to draw cardiac enzymes, right? And we have to wait for the enzymes to cook. And if the enzymes are elevated, so if you have elevated cardiac enzymes in the presence of ST depression, 
then that pretty much cements the diagnosis of an NSTEMI. Whereas if you have ST depression and normal cardiac enzymes, then that pushes you more toward unstable angina. But if you do a 12 lead and then you do a repeat 12 lead and now all of a sudden you have elevation, what have you just done? You can call it. Yeah, you can call a hospital back and say we have now progressed to a STEMI. Do an automatic cath lab activation. That patient doesn't have to sit in the ER in any longer than they have to. Okay. Now, best practice is that any patient with signs and symptoms suggesting acute coronary syndrome should have a 12 lead done within 10 minutes of presentation to the ER. But with that in mind, if you're able to detect that STEMI in the field, okay, that's 10 minutes potentially that you save that patient, right? And we know at a, about a third of the delay that patients experience getting to the cath lab occurs in the emergency room. Okay, a third of the delay occurs in, in the ER. So anything you can do to facilitate getting that patient to where they need to go can be really helpful, and that's why doing serial 12 leads can be very helpful. Looking for those changes and, and recognizing, oh, you know what, we have now progressed into a STEMI. This is an automatic cath lab activation. Um, okay, and then within hours to days, okay, we see the development of those pathological Q waves that we've talked about. And then over you know, days to you know, a week or so, we end up getting resolution. Now, what tends to resolve? Elevation. Yeah, your ST segment changes tend to resolve, but the pathological Q waves will tend to stick around because that tissue does not, is, is not particularly labile. Um, so the Q waves tend to remain. So you go back into a sinus rhythm uh, with pathological Q waves, or you could have a a bundle branch block or axis deviation or some other um, problem that that, some permanent problem that that, that STEMI caused. But the acute findings, the ST elevation, the hyperacute T waves, the ST depression, and so on, um, will resolve. You guys okay with that? All right, and I just want to quickly talk about this as well um, since uh, we talked about it during the quiz already, so we might as well um, get ourselves uh, good to go on this, and that is the reciprocal change concept. And with reciprocal changes, what is that? Well, that's ST depression in lead groups that oppose the lead groups where you have ST elevation. So let's just review. So if you have a STEMI of the inferior wall, leads 2, 3, AVF, the reciprocal group for that tends to be very high in the lateral wall, and you tend to see these changes. These are very pronounced in leads one in augmented vector left. You guys okay with that? All right. Let me uh, do that. Okay, so the high lateral wall is reciprocal to the inferior wall. Does that, does that make sense? So that would be the likely place to see reciprocal ST depression, T wave inversion. Um, if we look at the anterior wall, leads V1 through V4, okay, anterior slash septal. I just kind of called it anterior for simplicity, okay. Um, the inferior wall tends to be reciprocal to the anterior wall. And three, an augmented vector front. But one thing to notice is if there is no lateral involvement, you may very well not see the inferior reciprocal changes if it's isolated to the anterior septal area. Does that, that make sense? Because the high lateral wall is truly reciprocal to the inferior wall. Um, so you may, may in fact not see reciprocal changes in your inferior leads if you don't have any lateral extension. 
uh, if you have high lateral wall extension, so leads one and AVL, where do you suppose the reciprocal chains or changes are going to be there? Hmm? Inferior, right? And that makes sense. If the lateral wall, the high lateral wall, is reciprocal to the inferior wall, then it would make sense that the inferior wall would be reciprocal to the high lateral wall. Does that, that kind of make sense there? And then the posterior wall is a tricky one. Okay, the posterior wall is a tricky one in that there are no leads in a standard 12 lead that look directly at the posterior wall. But we know that the anterior wall is reciprocal to the posterior wall, right? And we know that if you get ST depression in the anterior wall, you should always suspect a posterior wall STEMI. You guys, you guys good with that? Cool. All right. Okay, let's go back there. Yes. Sorry about that. That's confusing, huh? Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to take V4, V5, and V6. And we'll take those and we'll move them over to the posterior wall, okay? And then we will relabel. So V4 will become V7. V5 will become V8. And V6 will become V9. Everybody okay? Sorry about the confusion there, but good for asking questions. So. If we look at the posterior view, um, find the scapula right here, and then find the spine right here. And what you're going to want to do is, you know where V6 goes, right? Everybody's okay with V6. So V6 would be kind of over here, more anterior. In line with V6, okay, so your posterior leads are going to be in line, in the same line, in the same plane as V6. Does that make sense? Not above or below, but in the same plane. And what I do is I find the tip of the scapula and under, just under the tip of the scapula in line with V6 is where V8 goes. So what I like to do, and, and you guys don't have to do it this way, but what I like to do is I find the, the, the posterior, um, or the, uh, the inferior rather, the inferior tip of the scapula and then I follow that down to where I'm in line with where V6 would be, and that's where V8 goes. You guys okay with that? Which would be V5, right? So you take V5 off the front and then move it to the back underneath the tip of the scapula there. V9 is just lateral of the spine and what, what's known as the paraspinal region. So what you do is you find the spine, okay, the spinal column, and that's really easy to find because your little spinous processes stick out and, you, and they make, generally make a straight line. You find them, and you go down to the line of V6, and then you <coughs> go <clears throat> just left of that, right? Just left of the spine, so where you're not on the bone itself, into what's known as the paraspinal region, and that's where V9 goes, Okay, and then V7 just goes between V6 and V8. Does that, does that make sense? And you can leave, when you run a poster, you can leave V6 in place. You can leave the electrode that you put there in place, and then you just use that as a guide for your posterior leads. You don't have to peel it off. You just leave it in place, right, and just pull the electrodes off and then move them on to the, the new ones. Does that, does that make sense there? Yeah, so you leave all the 12 leads on, or the electrodes. You leave the, the, the 10 electrodes on, and you just add three more, right? And then you just pop, pop them off, move them to the back, hit acquire again, okay, hit acquire again, and it will then acquire, it'll print out. Now, now the, the monitor doesn't know that you did this, so that's why you have to label those as V7, V8, and V9. Does that, does that make sense? That's why you'd label on your, your new 12 lead. Yeah. Does that, that kind of make sense? And now you've done what's called, called a modified 15 lead ECG.
And so what we'll do, if there is a posterior wall infarction present, that means that you're going to have more damage to the left ventricle, and this might possibly increase the mor morbidity and mortality as, as we talked about. So what leads are reciprocal to the posterior wall? Your anterior leads, yeah. Because what the anterior leads are right here, if you look coming out at you, and what is directly behind them? Hey, the posterior wall, right? So yeah, the posterior wall um, is going to, or the anterior leads are going to be uh, reciprocal to the posterior wall. So what we're going to do is we're going to look very closely at leads V1 through V3. Okay, those three leads are going to be very important. And so here I have a picture, and I have shamelessly stolen this from uh, a website, Life in the Fast Lane. And I did some research, and they have a Creative Commons um, uh, copyright um, license, which means that I should be able to use this picture in, in the context of education and as long as... Um, the video that I put up that have these pictures in it um, is not monetized, which none of the videos I put up are, are monetized. So it should be good. I don't think I'll get a copyright issue strike um, doing it this way. And I have referenced, I have put links in your notes as well where you can reference these, these 12 leads, these pictures as well. Okay, so let's zoom in on this. Okay. And let's see what we can see. So let's go ahead and start at 2, 3, and AVF, the inferior wall. What do we see? Elevation. Good. So I've got some elevation here in 2. 3, not a whole lot going on. What about AVF? Yeah, I've got elevation AVF as well. Contiguous. Not continuous, but contiguous. Is 2 contiguous of AVF? Yes. yes. Right? So you have a stemmy yeah. So we, we're already looking at an inferior stemmy. Let's now move on to uh, V1 and V2, so the septal wall. What do we see here? We see ST depression there. ST depression. How about V3 and V4? You've got some ST. And a little bit of depression in 4. Okay. Well, maybe that's that's a reciprocal change, right? Could be, right? Because we know that those are roughly reciprocal to the inferior wall, um, with the high lateral being really, truly reciprocal. Well, uh, speaking of lateral, let's move on to our lateral leads. What do we see here? Just a slight bit. How about V6? A little bit of elevation there. How about 1? Ever so slightly, AVL, yeah, not a whole lot going on there. So for sure, would you guys agree that we're looking at an inferior wall STEMI and maybe a little bit of lateral involvement? And uh, we've got some reciprocal changes there, right? We've got reciprocal change. We've got an inferior wall, reciprocal changes. Move right along, right? You guys, you guys good with that? Warm, fuzzy, comfortable? No? Come on, Cole. Come on. Going off of last Wednesday when Come we talked on. about the mirror test. What? Flip it. What is that? What is the mirror test? Flip the ZKG. Oh, so if we flip this, yeah, if we flip this upside down, pretend like we're looking at it in a mirror, does that depression look kind of like elevation? Uh-oh, what does that point to? That does point to the presence of a posterior wall myocardial infarction. Um, and in fact, that's what we're going to do. So, just to, just to recap, the presence of ST depression in V1 through V3 will suggest posterior wall MI, especially, right, in the setting of an inferior or lateral wall STEMI, so do not discount that depression in V1 through V3 as just being ischemia or a non-STEMI. So what I've done is I've taken these, these leads here, and I've enlarged them. I've flipped them around. All right. 
and I've do, we've done the mirror criteria, the mirror test on them. So we flip them around, and what does that now look like? It looks, looks like a massive amount of ST elevation. So when we do the mirror test, we have a positive mirror test that does suggest posterior wall infarct. Okay. And is there anything we can do to directly look at the posterior wall of the heart? What's that? There you go. Yeah, we can. And have you guys ever heard of a modified 15 lead ECG? Is that something you guys have ever heard of? Okay, yeah, so what we do is we will do a modified 15 lead. We're actually going to do that here in a few minutes. Okay, so what you do is you take lead, leads V4, V5, and V6. Okay, 4, 5, and 6. And we take them off of the anterior wall, and then we put them on the posterior wall. We run the 12 lead again, and then we write... V7 next to V4, V8 next to V5, and V9 next to V6. Or, let me say that again. V7 next to V1, V8 next to V2, and V9 next to V3. Excuse me. Yeah, it's, it's leads V1, V2, and V3. Okay. Are placed below the left scapula in order to directly view that posterior wall. Okay, so what we're going to do is after... So you move V4, V5, V6, but it comes out to be V1, V2, and V3 right. on your 12 lead? Yeah. yeah, look at that. That's kind of weird, huh? And let's take a look here. So, obtain the ECG posterior lead placement, right? We talked about 4, 5, and 6 labeled as V7, V8, and V9. And if you see ST elevation in your V leads, and this is really important, the threshold is much lower than the typical STEMI threshold. So our typical thresholds that we've been using up to this point, one millimeter or more, uh, or more than one millimeter in two or more contiguous leads, or more than two millimeters in a single lead, is what we typically use. This is greater than 0 0.5 millimeters, so half a box. Okay, If we have greater than that, then that is generally evidence that a posterior wall myocardial fart infarction is present. And so here we have a 15 lead, a modified 15 lead, where we've run those posterior leads, and what do you see? Yeah, pretty significant elevation, certainly greater than the 0 0.5 millimeters uh, threshold. So we would say that this patient, not only are they having an inferior wall STEMI, like we identified earlier, but they're also having a, a, a concomitantly occurring posterior wall myocardial, myocardial infarction. And you see kind of how easy that is to um, blow that off. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Could we have taken V1, V2, and V3 and put them on the posterior wall instead of 4, 5, and 6? Could we have done that and gotten the same results? Yes. yes, absolutely. Why do you suppose we didn't do that? There you go. Because you still have, because those are reciprocal to the posterior wall. So if you do it this way, where you use V4, V5, and V6, you can still show the reciprocal change, right? the depression in 1, 2, and 3, and the elevation in the posterior wall, and then you have a nice, tidy little package that you can, you can, you can chart, you can document. And it's really nice from a, from a documentation standpoint. It's really nice and tidy. And you can just make your case for posterior wall MI right there. Look at that. Oh, sounds like artists here. Oh. <laughs> All right. So does that make sense, guys? How cool is that? Has anyone ever done these? We'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll do them today. Um, on, on, our, on each other just because this may be the first time you've ever done a posterior.
uh, or a, fi a 15 lead. You guys good with that? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so that is one of the special kinds of um, infarctions that I wanted to talk about. The other one is a right ventricular infarction or an RVI. And I alluded to this last week that about 30 to 50 percent of all inferior wall myocardial infarctions will present with a right ventricular infarction. That should come as no surprise because it's the same coronary artery. And if and the problem is the right ventricle is not directly observed on a standard 12 lead, right? So what do we do? Well, I would suggest if an inferior wall MI is suspected, we should, as a matter of habit, always obtain a modified V4R, a right-sided ECG. V4R is going to be the most important lead. Some people will do three leads, like the posterior, V4, V3, V4, V5R, V4, V5, V6R. Some people may do that, like the posterior wall, and that's okay. But V4R has about 90% specificity and 90% sensitivity to detecting the presence of an RVI, which is very high. I mean, it's very good. So if you just use V4R, that, that, that alone is very good at um, ruling in or ruling out the possibility of an RVI. Okay. So what do you do? Well, you take V4 and you reflect it to the right side. What do I mean by reflecting it to the right side? Same position, just mirror. Just on the right side. Yeah, you just mirror it. Um, where, what, what anatomical structures does V4 normally go on? Midclavicular mid line. Fifth, fifth intercostal, fifth IC, right? Okay, so you just go midclavicular, fifth IC, right side, and put your electrode there. And then move V4 to the right side, run your 12 lead, and then what should you label? V4R. V4R. Cool. And this here is actually a 12 lead um, of a patient that I flew some years ago. Uh, this is actually out of Silver City. Um, having chest pain, was diaphoretic, uh, really diaphoretic, real bradycardic, um, and, and a little hypotensive. So if we look at 2-3 AVF, what do you see here? Yeah, pretty market elevation, would you guys agree? So this, this, this particular patient was having an inferior wall STEMI, or the right coronary arteries occluded. We know that that's a risk factor um, for RVI, one of the major ones. And so we ran the 12 lead again, okay? And here is what we did. We did V4, V5, and V6R. And what do you notice here in V4R? Elevation, absolutely. Massive elevation, um, and that pretty much confirmed the diagnosis of right ventricular infarction. Now, is this important clinically for us? Does this have some important clinical implications? What do you guys think? Other than, hey, I found out that there's increased morbidity mortality here, potentially. Um, what are the clinical implications? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So a decrease in preload can be a problem with this, right? As the right ventricle fails. So things, therapies that tend to decrease preload may potentially be harmful. What are some therapies that tend to decrease preload? That are very commonly given. Okay, morphine. How does morphine work? How does it decrease preload? It uh, decreases your blood pressure. How does it decrease blood pressure? Parasympathetic response. No, not parasympathetic. Yeah. Anyone ever had histamine or uh, morphine? No? You ever seen somebody get morphine? They ever get itchy? Very common side effect. Sometimes they get hives. So it releases mass. Uh, histamine. histamine, yeah. Morphine causes histamine release. Which will cause the same issues as an allergic reaction. Yeah. And so histamine will cause vasodilation. Mm 
And when you have vasodilation, particularly of your venous system, right, you're going to have a decrease in preload. Now, is that normally a good thing? If someone's having a STEMI, might that be a good thing? Yes. Yeah, the heart doesn't have to work as hard. It may not get as much blood, and that may be a good thing. But if you have a failing right ventricle, and we already talked about this last week, that one of the treatments for an RBI is to give fluid boluses, right? To kind of force, to kind of force preload into that right ventricle so we can get blood to the left ventricle. Medications that may inhibit that could be could be potentially harmful, like morphine. Um, what's another one that is notoriously good at decreasing preload? It's very commonly given. You guys had cardiac pharmacology already, right? You guys should be all over this. Nitro. Nitro. Nitrates, right? How do nitrates work? How does nitroglycerin work? What's its mechanism of action? Right? Oh, how does it vasodilate? Does anyone... No, it does actually this is one that doesn't work on a receptor. It modulates um, a molecule, a, a, an intracellular communicating molecule. It increases levels of something known as nitric oxide. Has ever heard of that? Or nitric oxide? Not nitrous oxide. Not the dentist stuff. <laughs> nitric oxide. Yeah, nitrates cause an increase in nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator. So yeah, nitrates in general, nitroglycerin being one type, causes vasodilation as well. Okay. So morphine, nitro, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, okay, they, they can also um, decrease preload. These are currently... Um, problematic if you identify RVI, even if the blood pressure is normal, right? Because normally, what have you guys been taught up to this point is basics and intermediates. The systolic blood pressure is 100 or greater, you can give nitro, right? Mm -hmm. Now you should pause and think about giving nitro. If you identify RVI, you may want to be much more cautious about giving nitro. Now, for years and years, we have taught this as dogma that nitro morphine harmful to people within, with uh, RBIs. And then last year, something happened. What happened? The guidelines are still the same, actually. The current gui AHA guidelines are still still the same, that it's pretty much contraindicated. Yeah, new evidence. Don't you hate evidence? Sometimes I hate it, because... It's tough. Human beings, we're very habit-forming creatures. We like habits. We like ideas and thoughts that make sense and that we can kind of grab onto and, and kind of go with. And we don't like anything that challenges our worldview. Um, so this is a challenging... So it was a study. It looked at um, a few, I think a couple hundred patients... And what it looked at was not RVI, but it looked at just inferior wall MI. So it looked at a, a couple hundred patients with inferior wall STEMI. And what they did was they, um, they gave half of them nitro and half of them didn't get nitro. And then they compared them to patients with anterior wall STEMI. Half got nitro, half didn't kind of thing. And what did they find as far as, and they used hypotension. Is, is what they were looking for, um, a systolic less than 90. Um, and what they found was that there was no difference. No difference in inferior wall STEMI versus anterior wall STEMI um, getting nitro. So no difference in hypotension between the two groups. Yeah, but they already had hypotension? They no, 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 they didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah. It didn't cause hypotension. Yeah, it didn't cause. Yeah, they used oh, okay. the less than, they said, so hey, if, if the nitro dropped their pressure below 90 systolic, then that was what oh. they considered hypotensive. And they found there was just, there was no difference in the inferior wall versus the anterior <laughs> septal wall STEMI patient groups. Now, there's an argument that you could make, well, they didn't know 
if those inferior walls had an RVI or not, right? Because they didn't look for that. So there is still a very real argument that, um, okay, maybe it's generally safe an inferior wall, but what about those 30 to 50%? How well were RVIs really um, looked at in this study? Well, they weren't at all. So it, it, we, we, it's hard to say um, at this point. Um, what we would need to do is we'd need to, like, identify RVI and then do the nitro thing. And that's a tough, if you're going in front of an institutional review board and you're saying, hey, we want to give something that pretty much everybody thinks is, is harmful um, to patients, how about you give me money and, and approve this at this, uh, yeah. Do you think the review board is going to sign off on that necessarily? Yeah, okay, so it may actually be hard, but basically what I'm saying is there is one study that is least challenging the dogma somewhat, and so as we go forward, I just, I want to throw that out because I, I want you guys to be flexible going forward, um, because there are going to be many things more than likely that, that we learn and that we talk about and that I teach that may change in the, in the coming years. Um, and so we just we just need to be flexible. I know it's really hard to change the world view. Um, um, it's really hard to change once you get these ideas and these thoughts and they, they kind of become cemented, um, particularly when you're young, like as a, as a young paramedic, and you guys are, you know, young paramedics. Um, it's hard to make that change, but just keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, as evidence rolls in, sometimes we've got to change. So what I want to do now is I want to spend a, a little time getting hands-on. Let me grab the monitors. It sounds like they're here, um, I think. So um, we'll grab the monitors, and uh, I'll have you guys do modified 15 leads and V4Rs on, on, your, on, on each other. And I'll open a lab up so you can actually document that. What I'd like is for you to print them off, label them. Okay, so print a regular 12 lead then do a modified 15 lead, then do a V4R, label them, take a picture, and then upload it into um, Platinum. Okay. And again, this is probably the first time a lot of you have actually done a modified uh, 12 lead. So. 